Raised in Canton, Ohio, Ronnie Harris grew up in a town where football was king and boxing was an afterthought. Harris turned to the sweet science as he was too small for football and couldn't play basketball. Growing up as one of eight children of a steel mill worker, Harris often said that if he were rich, he wouldn't be boxing. When he took up the sport, he promised his parents that if he got beat up, even once, he would quit. But the beating never happened as he compiled an amateur record of 60 wins against four losses, winning the National AAU Championship three times. In 1968, he would win the Olympic gold medal in the lightweight division and would be the only boxer aside from George Foreman to win Olympic gold. His father, Willie Harris, was the one who handed out the small USA flags to the boxers, including Foreman. In the Olympics, Harris was asked to give the same black glove fist salute demonstrated by Tommy Smith and John Carlos when they received their medals. Harris refused, as he didn't want to use politics to advance himself. I chose to be an athlete, Harris said. Athletes should not be used as pawns and tools. Harris would arrive home and cant into a hero's welcome with presidential candidate Hubert Humphrey by his side. There were doors open for him, and he had offers to make speeches and receive scholarship money for college. He would attend Kent State, graduating in 1971, with a double major in biology and sociology. He wanted to be a medical doctor, but he didn't have the funds. With an eye on the boxing scene, he noticed how fighters that were inferior to him were now making big money. Over three years after his Olympic win, Harris would turn professional, but he would soon find out that inactive idols only gather dust in the public's mind. People had forgotten about his Olympic win. No managers or promoters were beating down his door. He went from manager to manager. Moving to Miami, he became friends with Muhammad Ali and insisted on a sparring session with him. Harris did the Ali shuffle during their workout and Ali didn't take too kindly to the invitation. Still, Ali's trainer, Angelo Dundee, introduced Harris to Bill Cosby and a group of West Coast investors to manage his career. But the group would decline as Harris refused to switch over to a right-handed style which would make him an easier sell to networks and opponents alike. In 1974, Harris signed with Gil Clancy. He told Clancy he could beat anybody his weight in the gym. Clancy would put Harris in with Emil Griffith and Rodrigo Valdez. According to Harris, he got the better of both men and this upset Clancy. He thought Clancy put him on the shelf and he wasted three years of his prime being in Clancy's stable. Clancy's side of the story was that Harris was too headstrong for him to handle. He's a southpaw, Clancy said, and not exactly the most exciting fighter. Harris would leave Clancy and work out on his own, spending an unprofitable year fighting in Canada. Returning home, he would be struck by a vehicle while out jogging and almost killed. Harris claimed that while he lost consciousness, he received a religious revelation in which words from a Hebrew prayer came to him as he awaited his death. He would convert to Judaism and would nickname himself Mazel, which meant luck in Hebrew. Some viewed his conversion and name as a publicity stunt concocted by his new management team, Dennis Rappaport and Mike Jones, two real estate agents turned fight managers who were nicknamed the Wacko Twins. The duo convinced Harris of the advantages of being Jewish, coming up with the nickname of Maisel and the idea of Harris wearing a yarmulke in the ring. The head covering would be sewed into his afro, and Harris would sue for his right to wear it in the ring. Harris would win the lawsuit until commission officials went into the ring and ordered him to remove it. Harris did so, but left the ring and his father had to talk him into going through with the match. Harris's time with Rappaport and Jones would be his most productive, however. He would shut out Sugar Ray Seals over 10 rounds before going to England to face the highly regarded Alan Minter. Minter was thought to be a future champion and was favored over Harris. Harris, meanwhile, went into the fight with a broken jaw that he didn't mention to anyone for fear of missing out on the payday and the exposure. Again, holds again. 
is world-class stuff from Minter. Nobody's done this to Harris. Minter needs a left hand now like he's never needed anything. Another big attack. <laughs> blatantly in the face. So that 2,000 pounds put down at the ringside by the Harris corner at 6 to 4, beginning to look like a very healthy bet indeed. couldn't follow up and it doesn't seem to have made all that much difference and it's been called off Sid Nathan went to the corner had a close look at Vincent Blade and made up his own mind no help at all from the second enough Sid Nathan and the Harris corner understandably have gone mad the win over Minter earned Harris his biggest payday to date, earning 10 grand against Frank Reich. He would then tell off interviewer Gil Clancy after his win over Gratien Tana on national television, and the victory earned him a shot against middleweight champion Hugo Coro. Harris would start fast, taking an early lead before Coro closed the gap in the late rounds and won a close decision. The fight would be Harris's last televised appearance. He started his own trucking business, hauling industrial coal throughout Ohio for Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. He would fight sparingly over the next year and a half before being knocked out by the power-hitting Sammy Nesmith in the 10th round. Harris was ahead on two of the three judges' scorecards when a desperation left hook caught him coming in. Harris would fight only four more times over the next two years, watching the sport from the sidelines. When Roberto Duran troubled Marvin Hagler in 1983 for the middleweight title, Harris felt that he could have done a much better job. I watched what Duran did to Hagler, Harris said, caused that swelling around his eyes. In three or four rounds, I would have had Hagler's eyes closed, and that would be the end of him. After beating Bob Patterson by majority of decision in August of 1982, Harris would never fight again. Instead, he would focus his time running a successful transport company. His final boxing record would be 31 wins against two losses with 14 knockouts.